Can I just take a wee moment to say thank you to you folk who have been praying for us and for the work of ACRI. We really appreciate that. And I know some people were praying for us last weekend. We were in Portugal. It's just as cold here as it was out there, let me tell you. We had hot water bottles with us. It was so cold at night. But um, we are, uh, Jeffrey and Mariana were here. They're just at your missionary convention. It just seems like yesterday uh, that they were here with us. Um, to speak at the missionary convention and he mentioned about the Christmas outreach that we would be doing out in Santo Andre. There were nine of us went out from here and we had great opportunity of being able to share the gospel. Uh, I was sharing with someone earlier and saying how hard and dark and spiritually hard that it is there in that part of Portugal that Jeff and Mariana and Araldo and Emanuela work in. It is very, very difficult. People are very suspicious of the gospel, suspicious of any kind of religion a lot of the people, and they, whenever you're giving out literature, they don't even look at you. They're afraid in case you look at them and then change them into something or whatever. They're so afraid. And yet, uh, we thank the Lord for the great opportunities over last weekend of being able to take the gospel, that greatest story ever told, to people who many have never heard the truth of the gospel before. Hard for us to imagine in Northern Ireland, isn't it? Uh, we did different activities in the church, and we also uh, went carol singing around six different supermarkets that we got into. Um, we made it this year because in one of the supermarkets, they wouldn't allow us to come in last year. They allowed us in this year. Um, and they actually, someone, some of the staff came and did a video of us uh, and put it on their Facebook page and wrote that it was the evangelical church in Santo Andre that had come to bring Christmas greetings. Now, you might not think that's very special, but to us, that's a big step forward there in that part of Portugal. And we're so thankful for that and for the Christmas message we were able to bring. And thank you for praying for us. On the Saturday night after our activities were over, we went round to Sines, which is a, a town not very far away. And they had a Christmas market there. So we decided to go for a walk through the little cobble streets and all the little uh, stalls that were there. And it, it, was, it was beautiful to be there. But then we heard that there was a choir singing in the castle grounds. So we decided to go there and have a wee nosy. And um, they even had soda bread there, which you don't get in Portugal. But uh, someone from the Azores had come over and they had soda bread for sale. It was great. So we got our tea there and then we were listening to a black gospel choir. We couldn't believe it, that they were singing gospel hymns and of course the Christmas carols they were singing. And in between all the songs, they were sharing the gospel with Hundreds and hundreds of people who were standing listening. That's a big thing for Portugal. Please pray that God continues to work in hearts and lives. For the literature that we handed out to the people as they came past, that God will use that to touch hearts, open hearts, and that folk will come to know Christ in a personal way. We're planning next year already. <laughs> and we're hoping next year to have a live stable or a live nativity there in the grounds of the church um, because the nativity is a big big thing over there what they do at christmas eve is they have fish for their dinner and then they go along to many of them go along to mass uh, midnight mass and then whenever they come back someone has placed the baby jesus in the nativity scene that's the thing that they do in portugal and so we want to make something big of that next year and do something to try and reach the people get them over the doorstep of the church that's the first barrier broken down and uh, we're really praying about that already and trying to plan that as well. We value prayer for the coming year and all the activities of the mission. Our prayer letter is just hot off the press on Friday. It's sitting out there uh, on the, in the foyer. Please take one of them with you uh, tonight and have we read through it. Uh, Victor Maxwell um, and Audrey are heading off to America to their daughters for Christmas. And then I'm meeting them down in Manaus uh, in, in January, God willing. And then we're flying across to the northeast of Brazil to spend some time with our missionaries in the northeast. And then back to Manaus because the man who is in our market, uh, there is, he's about 78 years of age now, Hamundo Nanato. You need your teeth in to say his name. Uh, Hamundo Nanato, um, he is uh, celebrating so many years in the market, but it's the 50th anniversary of the market outreach there in Manaus. Uh, we're having a special meeting for that. And that will be uh, uh, towards the end of January this year, God willing. So we value prayer for that trip, that the Lord will be with us and help us uh, in our travels. And uh, uh, there are the meetings that we conduct. Uh, it's great to see what God is doing in Brazil, in the Northeast especially, 
The Lord is building his church and we're so thankful for that. So take the prayer letter, have a wee read at it and you'll see for yourself just some of the things that is going on uh, with our workers across the world. Let's have a wee word of prayer and then we'll come to God's word for our closing moments again this evening. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for the greatest story ever told. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who left the splendor of heaven, knowing that his destiny was the lonely hill of Golgotha, there to lay down his life for even me. Lord, we pray that tonight as we read your word together, familiar words to us, maybe, Lord, that you'll bless them to us. And Lord, that you will just use what we have to say tonight, Lord, to touch all of our hearts and remind us again of the greatest story ever told. Give help, we pray. We ask it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We're reading tonight from uh, Matthew chapter 2 and beginning to read at verse 1. Matthew chapter 2 and beginning to read together from verse 1, please. Matthew 2 and verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, And thy Bethlehem and the land of Judah Art not the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come, a, shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed and lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they departed... Sorry, and when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. We'll end there at verse 13, and again we know that God will bless the reading of his word to our hearts this evening. Christmas, of course, is a very busy time for people. And uh, folk are running around like headless chickens at the minute trying to buy gifts for people and trying to get their houses decorated and do all of these things and get food ready for Christmas. And so many activities are going on. And people think that that is what Christmas is all about. Isn't that true? But of course, we're here to tell the greatest story that has ever been told. To remind us again this evening, in the midst of all the chaos around us, the real reason for the season is the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been reading part of the Christmas story tonight. There are only two accounts of the birth of Christ given in the Bible. Luke's account speaks of the actual night of Jesus' birth. Matthew's account that we've read here speaks of the subsequent details of the Christmas account, all important parts of the story. The journey of the wise men to Bethlehem isn't mentioned in Luke's account, and in reading the account in Matthew, we find that it occurred several months, possibly up to two years after the birth of the Lord Jesus. Nonetheless, it's a very important part of the Christmas message and deserves to be included as part of the celebration of Christmas for us. Matthew writes his book from a Jewish standpoint, and so ancestry is a very important component for him. The uh, the. Uh, uh, Matthew in, in his writing here lists uh, in chapter 1 if we uh, go back to it lists uh, lots of names some of these names that we can't even pronounce that we see here but you see these names are important to us because of course he tells us the genealogy uh, uh, lists them in chapter 1 and traces back the lineage of Christ all the way back to Abraham and most of the Jews uh, uh, of Jesus time like to be able to trace their ancestry right back their lineage right back to Abraham. 
And of course, to be able to do this meant that you were a part of God's chosen people. Matthew does something unique for his time in that he included women in this. Rahab, of course, had the two spies that were sent to investigate the promised land. Ruth was the great-grandmother of David. And the other woman that he mentions here is Mary. As the mother of Jesus, he's very careful not to list Joseph in that, as the father of Jesus, but only as the husband of Mary. And of course, we read through this on all these different names there in chapter 1. The wise men, of course, are a very important part of this uh, story that we're reading again tonight. They've been given other names through the years, but their part in the Christmas story is of vital importance. We believe they came from Persia or modern-day Iran. It was an area that was the Jewish people were led as captives during the time of Daniel. And so the wise men would have access to much of the Jewish history and writings uh, and something of the prophecy of the Messiah. There were astrologers. Some people tell us that they were magicians, but we like to know them as astrologers. And they believed that whenever a significant birth took place, such as the birth of a king, that the stars would announce the king's birth with a bright star. They saw such a star when Jesus was born, and they decided to follow that star, and they began their search for a king. The journey, as we know, took them several months. They had to put their caravan together, their the crowd of men who went, it doesn't tell us there was just three of them, but there was probably a, a, quite a number of them that went to follow this star. They got as much information as they could about the star. They made a personal commitment to themselves not to stop until they found the king where this star was leading them to. At this point, of course, they didn't know it was Jesus. Jerusalem and Bethlehem were very close together with only about eight miles separating the two. And the wise men looking for a king went to Jerusalem where they thought the king would be born. They went to Herod's palace where they thought a king would be born. Herod, of course, had paid no attention to the babe of Bethlehem when he was born. He had thought that it was just a threat. And he didn't want anyone taking his rule. He didn't want anyone else to be known as the king of the Jews, only himself. And so we see that the wise men came to his palace and they asked the question, where is he? who is born king of the Jews. For we have seen a star in the east and we're come to worship him. Herod called his religious leaders together as we've read here tonight and determined from the wise men when the star first appeared and formulated a backup plan. He himself tried to be very smart and felt that he could outsmart these wise men too. He told them to go and find the king and come back to him afterwards and tell him where the king was, that he could also go there and that he could pay homage to the king. Yet we know that he really wanted to kill him and get rid of him. What Herod didn't understand is that something happened to the wise men that night that they met the Lord Jesus. When they found him, they came searching for a great king. And when they found Jesus, they found the king, the king of kings. The Bible says that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Their lives would never be the same again after they met him. The king that was in their presence, Jesus, in their eyes was worth their best. And so we read again tonight that they brought their gifts of gold for kingship. They brought their gift of frankincense for deity. And they brought their gift of mare that resembled death. They give their best for the one who would give his best for them. We're not told how long they stayed in Bethlehem, but they must have stayed days. But then we're reminded that they were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod's palace, but to return home a different way. Those wise men represent each of us. The key to finding Christ, we must want him with all of our hearts. We know that there's something missing in our lives. And that desire should be strong enough that will stop or help us to not stop searching until we find it. We must have the same desire as they had to find the King of Kings. And maybe you're here tonight and you're not saved. And you don't know Christ personally. You know about him, but you've never come to trust him. You're here tonight, not out of chance, but you're here tonight because God has brought you here tonight. 
Maybe to speak to your heart for the very last time. To touch your heart for the very last time. To help you to see that tonight, that today is the day of salvation. That you need to come and trust him as your saviour. I want to leave a very simple point with you tonight. A simple gospel message. That's all. As we think of the wise men coming here to Herod's palace, I just want to leave three words with you. Where is he? That's the question that they asked Herod whenever they came to the palace. Where is he who is born king of the Jews? And as we look back through the Gospels, as we look back through the word of God, as we look back over the last 2,000 years, we have the answer already. We know the answer that the wise men didn't know that day. And we can say tonight as we think of where is he that he's not in the crib. Luke 2 reminds us that there were in the same country shepherds watching over the flocks by night. And though the, though the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, fear not. For behold, I bring you glad tidings of great joy. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts singing praises to God. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth peace. Goodwill to all men. Can you imagine the fear in the shepherds that night? As the sky lit up and the angels came with the promise that God had fulfilled his promises to the world. That the baby, Jesus Christ, was born. A saviour was born to them. Victor Maxwell was talking, telling us a story there just um, a few days ago of how that he had a, a trip out to Israel a number of years ago. And they'd got out to the shepherd's field one night. They'd asked permission to go out and they'd been allowed to go out to the shepherd's field one night. And they had someone there who was telling them the accounts of the shepherds. And he said, we're standing listening so carefully. And the next thing, the sky lit up all around us and scared the life out of us. It was a flare going off. <laughs> And he said, we were so scared. Can you imagine, he said, how the shepherds must have felt as the sky lit up with the good news that the Savior was born. God kept his promise. God had promised a way back in the Garden of Eden that one day he would send a Savior. Adam and Eve had sinned against God. They had disobeyed God. They were put out of the Garden of Eden. And God promised that one day he would send a Savior into the world. One who would come to defeat sin and hell and death and the grave. And many, many generations thought the promised Messiah would never come. And yet as we read through the Old Testament, we see the uh, prophecies of his coming into the world. Isaiah 7, 14, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. God always keeps his promises. And God kept his promise to the world in sending this little baby into the world. Again, we quote so often John 3, 16, don't we? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Every child grows up, don't they? If my mother started to go cuckoo and ca ca at me, I'd get her locked up. She doesn't do that anymore. She did once. <laughs> but every baby grows up. And again, we get the account there in Luke chapter 2 of whenever the Lord Jesus was 13 at the temple. Whenever Mary and Joseph had come to Jerusalem and they had gone home with the crowds of people and didn't realize that he wasn't with them. Mary thought he was with Joseph. Joseph thought he was with Mary. Maybe they both thought that he was with the children as they went together back home again. And then they realized that they had left him behind. And they had to go back sorrowfully searching for him into Jerusalem. You can imagine how frantic they were as they looked for this little boy. And yet they found him in the temple. And he said, of course, did you not realize that it would be about my father's business? They didn't know him the way they thought they did, did they? We get the accounts of that. 
He grew up into a boy. He grew up into a man. And again, as we read through the Gospels of his earthly ministry and see the wonderful miracles that the Lord Jesus did, how that he fed the multitudes, how that he healed the sick, how he raised the dead, how he made the dumb to speak and the deaf to hear, how he made the lame to walk, the many wonderful things that Jesus did. But he didn't just come that we could have Christmas. He didn't just come into the world to heal the sick or to feed the multitudes of people or to have a crowd of people follow him. That's not why he came. He lived his life under the shadow of the cross, didn't he? And the Lord Jesus, as he grew up in life, knew that one day he would go all the way to the cross and he would give his life for you and for me on that cross on Calvary. He's not in the crib tonight. We look around us and we go through our times quite often. And as I said, in Portugal, everywhere you went, there was nativity scenes everywhere of a little baby in a manger. But he's not in the crib tonight. Where is he? We could also say that he's not in the crib, but he's not on the cross either. Many of you know that we go to Fatima in Portugal twice a year for the outreaches there. And it's heartbreaking because everywhere you go, there's an image of a person on a cross. Some of them are so grotesque, you don't even want to look at them. Everywhere you go, there's an image on a cross, but you never see an empty cross. The Lord Jesus Christ lived his life under the shadow of the cross. I love an illustration that I heard many years ago, and it speaks of an artist who painted a painting of, of a boy standing in a carpenter's shop. And he's standing with a hand on each side of the window and be, uh, uh, through the window comes a ray of sunshine and behind this boy is a shadow of a cross. And the Lord Jesus Christ lived his life under the shadow of the cross, didn't he? Everywhere he went and everything he did, he lived his life under the shadow of the cross, knowing that one day he would go to the cross. Again, didn't he say to Mary, would I not be about my father's business? He knew that one day he would go to the cross. In Gethsemane, as he cried out, not my will, but thy will be done. As he rode into Jerusalem, that entry into Jerusalem, of course, as the people came and they threw down their cloaks and their, their palm branches and they cried, Hosanna, Hosanna. As he went through the unjust trials of that week ahead of him. As he was taken to Pilate's judgment hall, and stood beside a robe called Barabbas. And as Pilate said, who do you want to release to the crowd? Jesus, Barabbas. And they cried out, release Barabbas and crucify Jesus. Many of the crowd who stood just a few days before, putting their palm branches before him and crying, Hosanna, were now crying, crucify him. Away with him, we want nothing to do with him. What a change in just a few days as he was taken and punched, spat upon, beaten, his visage marred more than any man. As the Lord Jesus Christ was led up that hillside of Calvary, as they nailed his hands and feet to a cross, as he was raised up between heaven and earth, the only mediator between God and man, the only way to pay for our sin by his death on the cross. As he cried out on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. As he said to the thief who cried out, Lord, remember me. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. As he said to his mother, behold thy son. To the disciple, behold thy mother. As he cried out the words, I thirst. As he cried out those words, it is finished. Salvation's plan was accomplished. As he paid the debt that we could never pay. In giving his life and shedding his blood. For the remission of sin. Fulfilling the scriptures, the prophecies of Psalm 22. The prophecies of Isaiah 53. The one who would be led like a lamb to the slaughter, the one who'd be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. 
as prophecy was fulfilled. As he cried out into thy hands, I commend my spirit, and having said thus, gave up the ghost. As he gave his life for you and for me. But he's not in the crib tonight. And he's not on the cross tonight. We have an empty cross. Where is he? We could say that he's not in the cemetery, couldn't we? He was placed in the new tomb. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, members of the Jewish council, took care of the burial. That new tomb prepared in the garden near Golgotha. And as they took tenderly and lovingly the body of the Lord Jesus from the cross, after they'd asked permission, they put him in those clean cloths and took that body and placed it in the new tomb. But he's not in the cemetery tonight. Many people visit cemeteries of loved ones who have passed on into eternity. Many sit by the grave and talk to the person. We've seen that often. Many worship there in different religions. But thank the Lord tonight we have an empty tomb. He's not in the cemetery. That's the difference today. Because the world religions had a leader who lived and led them and died and was buried and is in a grave somewhere today. Sometimes their bones are taken as relics and they're taken around the world. But we have an empty tomb. We have a living Savior. The wee chorus says, you ask me how I know he lives because he lives within my heart. That's the difference today. He's not in the cemetery. He's alive. And of course, as the witnesses, as we read there at the end of Luke, the witnesses uh, saw the risen Lord Jesus Christ. They spoke with him. The men on the Emmaus Road, as they walked with him, as Jesus drew alongside and walked with them, the witnesses. He's not in the cemetery. Time's nearly away. Where is he? He is not in the crib. He's not on the cross. He's not in the cemetery. Where is he? He is crowned in glory. Isn't that right? He took the disciples out to Mount Olivet. He lifted his hands to bless them. And he went up into heaven. Back to God as Father. Didn't he promise in John 14, in my Father's house are many mansions? If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again in the same way as you've seen, uh, come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Remember the angel said to the disciples that day on Mount Olivet, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who has gone away from you will come again in the same way, in like manner as you have seen him go. Where is he? He is crowned in glory. He's seated at the right hand of the Father tonight. And he's making intercession for you and for me. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it, for a believer tonight to know? That he's the one who knows us tonight as individuals. He's the one tonight who knows our needs, who knows our hearts, who knows our burdens, who knows our heartaches, who knows our concerns, who knows our health issues, who knows our financial issues, who knows exactly what we're going through tonight. Maybe the person sitting beside us doesn't know what we're going through. Maybe the person around us has no idea of the heartaches that we have or the burdens that we bear day by day. But yet he's the one who knows, who loves, who cares. Nothing is truth condemned. He's the one who understands us tonight in the midst of difficulties and trials and problems. He's the one who is with us who promises that he will never leave us and never forsake us. And the one who goes through it with us, even though sometimes we don't understand. There's a wee poem that I sometimes quote to people. It says, understanding isn't easy, however hard we try. There are things that happen to us that leave us wondering why. But we must go on trusting as down the aisle of life we tread. Be still and know that he is God. 
and by his hand be led until the mist has lifted and we can truly see that this dark and lonesome hour really had to be. We sang about it earlier, that he knows our heartaches and he knows our burdens and he knows our concerns tonight. And he's the one who we can cast our care upon because he cares for us. Maybe you're here tonight and you're not saved. He knows you tonight and he knows your greatest need of all, salvation from sin. So many of us think we need so many things in life, don't we? And maybe so many have so many things that this world can offer them and give them. The things that money can buy, they have it, but they have no peace and they have no joy and they have no satisfaction. There was a man we sat with earlier on this year who was dying and he talked about God's perfect peace that passes all understanding. He said it's not just peace, but it's perfect peace. And maybe you're here tonight and you don't have that perfect peace. You don't have that joy. You don't have that assurance that heaven is your home for all eternity. He's the one who knows your need tonight. And he's the one who's able to meet your need. Salvation from sin. If only you cry out to him. He promises to save to the uttermost. Where is he? Time's gone. He's not on the crib and he's not on the cross. He's not in the cemetery. He is crowned in glory. And the word of God reminds us that he is coming again. He came the first time in humiliation to just a little stable in Bethlehem. But the next time he comes, he will come in glory. The hymn writer says the next time he comes, he won't have to die for me. The next time he comes, there won't be a Calvary. The next time he comes, we'll begin eternity. And when he comes again, he'll be coming for me. By the signs of the times, and we haven't time to go into that tonight around us, in all that's happening in our world today, we can see that the coming of the Lord draws nigh, doesn't it? It reminds us to look up when we see these things because the Lord is coming soon. His appearing will be sudden. It'll be glorious with great power. Every eye shall see him. And one day every knee will bow before him and confess that he is Lord. He's coming soon. Do we believe it tonight? That he's coming soon? A world around us is lost in sin tonight without a saviour. A world around us is going heedless and careless to a lost eternity. Do we believe that Jesus is coming soon? What are we doing to reach others for Christ? What are we doing to reach out to our communities around us where we live, people we rub shoulders with day by day? He's coming soon. For many, it'll be a sorry day. It'll be a sad day. It'll be a separating day, won't it? Because you're going to be lost for all of eternity. There's no going back. There's no second chance. There's no more opportunity. If the Lord came tonight as he could, if death came tonight as it could to any of us, I wonder where will you be in eternity? For you, will it be too late? Where is he? The wise men, they left Herod's palace. They followed the star. They came to Bethlehem, as we've said already. They gave their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. They worshipped the King of kings and Lord of lords. As I said, they went back a different way after they met the Lord Jesus. And I believe whenever we meet the Lord Jesus that we go a different way. 2 Corinthians 5.17 reminds us, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 
They left a different way because Jesus changed their lives. Isn't it good tonight to know that you can leave this church this evening different than the way you came in? Because you have met with the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. Because tonight you can leave here knowing your sins forgiven, knowing peace with God, and knowing the assurance of a promised home in heaven. Where is he? He's not in the crib. He's not on the, the cross. He's not in the cemetery. He's crowned in glory. He's coming again. But the most important question tonight is to each one of us. Where is he in your life tonight? Is he king of kings? Or is he just a name that we have never trusted in? May God help us to come to him. And may God help us to trust him and get the greatest gift of all this Christmas in the gift of eternal life. We're going to sing our closing hymn. It's number 170 in the chorus book. Again, it reminds us of all the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us when I survey the wondrous cross in which the Prince of Glory died. Let's stand together as we sing it through. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for the challenge of that hymn tonight. And as we think of your great love to us and coming into this world and going all the way to the cross because you loved us. Lord, help us to sing those words with all of our heart, with the whole realm of nature mine. That were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Lord, if there should be someone here tonight not see you, we pray, Lord, that tonight will be the night whenever they'll throw down their arms of rebellion and trust the Lord Jesus Christ before it's forever too late. Bless us now, Lord, as we go one from the other. Keep your hand upon us, we pray, for good and for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>